My name is Karen Lynch, and am I a social entrepreneur? You can answer that question at the end. Um, firstly, I'd like to say a thank you for making me feel so welcome. It is a new thing for us to be embraced by the social enterprise community, the social enterprise sector. I'll explain why in a moment. Um, secondly, I'd like to say this is a bit weird for me. I'm used to having 37 slides, charts, carbon emissions, social value numbers, lots of nice pictures before and after, and the screen doesn't appear to be working. Which is okay, because tonight actually I was briefed to give you a, a, a personal journey of my time entering into the world of social enterprise. But I had a bloody brilliant family album to take you through. through all of the things over the last few years that have driven me on, impacted on my family, a few nice shots from the beach, and you're going to miss all of those. So if tomorrow over coffee you want to have a look at my photos, or later on tonight, give me a shout and they're down here on my laptop. Um, so this is a bit strange. It feels quite cosy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so my brief was to talk about social value from a business perspective. That was the email that followed the first email that said, talk about my personal social enterprise journey. I'm not sure which one you'd had a glass of wine before sending. Both. What's your preference, guys? G give me a kind of 70-30, 50-50, personal, personal experience, social value from a business perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Kate wants it all. Kate wants it all. Okay. Um, so just to help me a little bit, how many of you are familiar with Bellow Water? Can you raise a hand? Okay. So about 20% haven't heard of us at all. I'm going to sack the marketing director. <laughs> Clearly. Um, okay. So um, I've spoken a million times about the tremendous turnaround story from the rags to riches, the David and Goliath tale that was blue and is blue now. It's a really brilliant story and I'm not going to talk about that at all. <laughs> because you've all read it, right? In the Times or the Telegraph or Time magazine or the Guardian or the Social Enterprise Network or Pioneer's Post. And, and I guess that would just sum up the last 18 months that I've had at Blue. I cannot believe people are still asking us about Blue. I cannot believe that somebody else wants to print that bloody shot of me with all the bottles and all the hair. Well, you might want to, obviously. But... <laughs> um, sorry. Um, um, but that kind of sums up the, the roller coaster that has just peaked and peaked and peaked some more over the last 18 months. Um, and all of that is fabulous. What's, what's more interesting is kind of how I ended up here. So I'm going to begin with that tale, soon as you voted for the personal bit. Okay. So um, my background, um, I spent 13 years working in media. I worked for a business that was then called EMAP, now called Bauer. I published magazine, I published events massively accountable, p &L responsibility, and it was amazing. I worked with people who were indulging in their passions every day. I worked with fishermen who were on Anglin Times. I worked with equ equestrian competitors who worked on your horse magazine. I worked with golfers. We published today's golfer. Um, whatever your hobby, bird watching, gardening, if there's a magazine there, photography, um, oh, the flash <laughs> inspired me there. Um, I've published a magazine and, and ran what was a separate P&L within a lim limited company. It was the best job in the world. And then some bastard launched the internet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and um, it was like, bloody hell, what do we do now then? We all love these pictures and flicking through. And everybody's putting pressure on us to invest in the internet. And um, at that time, I was really, really lucky. And I'd met the love of my life. He just kind of happened to have met me through business. He ran the magazine business at WH Smith. There was a tiny conflict of interest. We had the odd complaint from the BBC. We decided one of us should probably move on and do something different. And, and I was the first to get a terrific job offer and moved into the world of finance. I shan't talk too much about my time in the world of finance. Apologies to those of you who um, are more inclined to be positive in that space. I worked bloody hard, learnt a lot, but working for Barclays and for finance wasn't really me at all. But it did fuel what has since driven me on to focus on wanting to work in this sector. In my time at Barclays, I looked after 30,000 items. I looked after all of our branch network. Every marketing message, every bloody pen. Remember that Free the Pens campaign? Anything you saw on a branch was uh, because of me and my team. And, and I learned a lot about waste. In fact, it became a bit of an obsession. Um, and as part of their talent programme, um, 
we went through, you know, tick boxes. You've done the more online research, and then you sit down with someone who tells you about you. We've all had one of those. And how did it take me so long to actually look back at somebody and go, yeah, you're right, and I hadn't seen it. And now look back at lots of different things I'd done through my youth whole other story and realise I did have this obsession about waste. Wasted time, wasted resource, wasted cash. But most importantly, that I was wasting my bloody life. So I did what all of us would do at that point, right? Went back and did my job a bit longer. <laughs> Spent each and every day at some point saying to someone who would listen, what's your purpose? Why are you here? You know, and I started becoming obsessed and, and jealous of people who had a really clear vocation. Because midwives, <laughs> you know, pe doctors, people who knew what they wanted to do. You know, I desperately wanted to feel that I was doing the right thing. I was driving my friends, family, as you can imagine, up the wall by this point. But it didn't last too long because I had organ failure, ended up in a coma, and there, that was very nearly it. But what it was, was the tipping point for me to say enough's enough. Um, I don't suggest any of you who think you're in the wrong job right now wait until that point. <laughs> Quit sooner, and let's hope you're not in this room. Um, but it did force us as, as a family to say, time to move on and do something different. And my husband, whether he meant it or not, said, darling, I fully support you. Do what you want to do. And he really meant that until my short list of future careers was thicker. <laughs> Midwife. <laughs> <laughs> Organic, and that's the important bit, pig farmer. Or I'm going to go and work for a charity. So what did he say? That sounds really interesting, darling. <laughs> the organic pig farmer bit's a bit complicated. We don't have any land, but I understand why you're interested. We don't go to church. Is that compulsory? And nor do you like the sight of blood. But apart from that, they're really good suggestions. The not-for-profit sector is what I think they like to call themselves, darling. You know, why don't you explore that a bit more? And um, the next three months, by this time I've finished my garden leave, which was far too short, and I didn't make anywhere near enough, enough of it, um, I wrote to all my favourite charities. Charities I had a connection to because of my own connection or my family history. I shan't name and shame, but what I will say is not one of them wrote back to me. Not one. And emotionally, that probably took me from being at my highest in terms of at last I'm taking the leap to do something positive about my future, to my lowest ebb. It was miserable. So I did what most of you in my position would do. I went to work for Audi. Not with the L, Audi with a U. Um, and I got to drive a new... Oh, my husband got to drive a new car every two weeks. He loved that job more than I did. <laughs> By this time, I'm consulting, and actually what I've done is bought myself some space. I'm going to go and consult and not make any big decisions, but I need to be working. I then went to work for a spin-out from um, Northern Foods. I went to work at Pork Farms. You can see the connection, right? You can see what was driving some of the decision-making. You can see the Googling I was doing even then. And I've not eaten the pork pie since, but that's another story as well. Um, and it was... In the midst of those contracts, which is about the next nine months, I saw an ad in The Guardian, which is about helping to save the planet. And it was a company I'd never heard of called Baloo. So I don't know how many of you know this, but Baloo was actually founded in 2004. And it was, um, at that time, a little-known brand, if it was indeed a brand at all, but it had an intent about campaigning about the environment through a bottled water business. So I did a bit of a Google and thought, shit, they need some help. You know, branding and marketing was my background, it was my passion. And they had a million messages about saving the world, penguin friendly, compostable, um, you know, anything you can do to make the world better, blue can do it. I thought, yeah, they, they need some help with their messaging. Never heard of them, but, you know, I've not really been looking. And, uh, and I went down and, and met the then founder and... Um, if I'm honest, I came away a bit confused. And um, I'm not sure why. I get, I get end a contract, not a lot to lose. I took the job as marketing director and spent the next three months confused. In fact, often standing at the entrance to Can Mezzanine and Lowman Street at that time. Um, increasingly confused that either I had gone bonkers in my time off and career challenged year. Um, or that everybody else here looking at Baloo was bonkers, because to me it was blatantly obvious. Now, I didn't know this at the time, 
but this was my first dance with social value. So I get that we should all drink less bottled water. I get that one way to do this is to raise the profile of the bad bits of the industry. I get why you might want to demonstrate positive behaviours, but what I don't get is why you would spend so much money doing it, because clearly it's not sustainable. Um, and little did I know, I joined a company, taken a job. It was a job, not a contract, actually. And, um, and within literally weeks, there was the advisory board who kind of said, yeah, we've kind of done enough, no more cash. Um, we had no cash. Um, so is there anything to save? Is there any assets in the business worth saving? Um, and that was the bit where it was kind of shit or bust, nothing to lose. And instead of, I guess, stalling, thinking, I'm the person who bought these bonkers here, and it's a world of not-for-profit I don't understand, I started to think, well, what if I just apply everything I know about good business, about the corporate world, and, 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 and what if you could actually develop a brand that was all about the environment and was all about doing good? What if you exemplified what ethics looked like in business? And what if you made that so true and so convincing and so transparent that how could people say no? You know, I'm going to go and talk to Raymond Blanc if I present this. How is he going to say no? And imagine we could do that and actually make some money. And then we could do some more good with that money. And as I say, this was my first dance with creating environmental improvement, which wasn't just about us, about the influence in the sector. And it was about creating real revenues instead of donations, instead of philanthropy as we know it. Um, so I had already in my head kind of, well, I guess got ready to present a business plan that I thought, no way is anybody going to listen. And I don't know how much of you know, but Blue uh, was originally backed by Gordon Roddick, uh, Chris Hahn and Ben Goldsmith. And, um, and this was my first meeting with these guys to say, look, I'm new, you know, four months in, here's a paper. Um, this is what I would do if it was my money. Um, but over to you, and, and then, then began the most difficult time. It was, Karen, that makes perfect sense. Will you come in as CEO and do that? Now, when you've got an incumbent CEO in the business who was the founder, I can honestly tell you, emotionally, that is the toughest place to be. It was awful for six months. As he exited, and I was trying to save the jobs of those who were left and try and reconfigure a business, it was the toughest time in my career. But there was something about that time that made it all worthwhile, and that was about just a desire to, as crazy as that model sounds, of course, piece of cake, let's compete with Evian, with Buxton, with Volvic, with San Pellegrino, and, oh, you've got debt, you've got no cash, you've got debt. Um, of course, piece of cake, right? But, you know, you have to love a David and Goliath story. We changed everything about the business, from the brand to the structure, the operational model, and three years on, that all seems, this is my, I just finished four years, it seems like a very different world, very different world. So Blue, today I can say hand on heart, is the UK's most ethical water brand. We exemplify environmental standards in our industry, and I know that because the big guys in the industry talk to us, they collaborate with us, we work with them, we operate very differently, and actually coming from particularly the world of high street banks, to collaborate with your competitors is the most amazing experience to share learning. And you always walk out thinking, should we have signed a non-disclosure? And um, we probably should have done in many cases. Um, but it's, it's amazing that this little water business genuinely is able to, without restrictions from our, from our board, step up to trying to make the, the world a better place in this area of industry first and foremost. So social value for, for us, um, we measure, all of you should have had, unless anybody arrived really early and my parcel didn't, uh, one of the Blue's impact reports. Yes? If you haven't got one, please um, ask at reception. They should have a few left. But um, this year we produced our first social impact report uh, with help from the consultants at CAN. Um, funded by the ARC programme, must give everybody their name drop. And, and honestly, do you know what? We, this is something we probably should have done two years ago. And it seems like a piece of cake, we've done it now, but honest to God, it was like birthing a baby. It was, how do you take everything about your story? You know, the emotion, the ethics, the principles, the decision-making, the operational model, and all of the evidence behind it, and try to make that readable, understandable, believable, transparent. So this is not perfect, 
But by God, we've had some amazing feedback and it's the best job we could have done at the time. So it's interesting. We, we, we don't separate out our social impact into pillars. We think, we, we think our social impact is all of those pillars together because by, if you don't save the planet, where's everybody else we've saved going to live, right? So for us, environment is equally as important. In fact, environment for blue comes first. So we measure our carbon footprint. I'm glad you told me whoever it was said it's easy. Um, yeah. <laughs> whoever said it was easy, it's not easy. It's complicated. You need to work with experts. It's expensive. If you're a low budget, no budget, you know, every 15 pounds I spend could have saved a life, transformed a life. Um, it's hard. It's a hard decision to take, but from you know, a business that's trying to establish itself through a strategy of demonstrating confidence and credibility and beauty in everything that we do, it was really, really important. So we're really proud of this because it tells in circular format our view on what social value is. It's about saying you don't need funding, you don't need grants, you don't need philanthropy in your model to trade. You can generate and you can be self-sustaining. You can do that by upholding the best and the highest environmental credentials. And also, you don't have to do it all. If you don't know um, the detail, Blue is the exclusive partner of War Trade. We've decided that the bit we're really good at is generating, competing in the corporate world, making revenues, and we think War Trade are better than us at delivering access to clean water, sanitation, and hygiene education in the 26 countries in which they work. We originally set out, and actually I remember this, this is, a, this, this is what I wouldn't have done if I was World Trade. Hi, we're from Blue, and we've been trading for five years, and we've accrued losses of 1.9 million, but next year we're going to make a profit, £100,000, and we'd like to give it to you. <laughs> I suppose they didn't have a lot to lose, really. So they signed on the dotted line, we signed on the dotted line, and we've just finished our first three years, so we signed for three years. And in that three years, we have delivered not £300,000, but £518,000, which is equivalent to transforming 34,000 lives. Thank you. And what's really interesting is the effect that had on our philanthropic funders. I, sh I should have explained, funding's a whole other, uh, a whole other chat. Um, but it inspired our funders to say, do you know what, we could have given this money to charity once it's done its job we gave it to you, Karen, and you've now gifted that on. So actually, of the remaining debt, um, they've written down and we've paid back half. So as we go into 2014, Blue has got a positive balance sheet. We are debt free. And, and what that means is we can have really, really interesting conversations now with our partner, Watered, about social value. So how much should we hand over right now and transform lives today versus how much should we reinvest in the business jointly deciding the greater impact that they can have over time. Um, we've not had those conversations yet. Um, we've always overpaid. For us, our biggest marketing message is the amount we've been able to give. Um, and right now, we start this year sitting down saying, what do we do? What makes most sense? And in order to give us some time to establish that, we've just signed a new contract to 2020 with War Trade, which is very, very exciting. How am I doing for time? OK, so. Um, so in summary, um, I've had a great time. <laughs> yeah, now I'm going to get my own So in summary, I've had a great time at Blue. Um, for the majority of that time, I did feel like we were a misfit in the sector. I've never called myself a social entrepreneur, and in fact, we never called ourselves a social enterprise until two years ago when, I can't remember the name of the, the young lady, knocked on doors, and we'd love to case study Blue, and of course with no marketing budget. Oh, would you really? Yeah, sure, fine, we'll come and talk to you about our story. And we've have had a fabulous relationship with Social Enterprise UK, and we've had an enormous amount of coverage because of that collaboration, so we are very grateful. Um, so it's... Her name was Fran. <laughs> <laughs> was it Fran? That was the lady that since left before then. But anyway, it's, personally for me, it's been a ball. Um, but I don't, I always try not to compartmentalise us as a social enterprise. For me, it's about making business better by exemplifying a different way to be. And, and when I look back, I think the case for all of us to do that exists. I was going to run you through a quick family album. You know, my dad um, was the inspiration by a social enterprise we, we launched this year called um, Ethical Glass. 
he just said, get to grips with your supply chain, girl. He's an engineer. You know, he thought like that. And around you, there's inspiration to make a difference. That's another story. My, my goddaughter is desperate to go and work for Gandhi's flip-flops. Blue just isn't cool enough. We need to launch a social yeah. enterprise cooler than Gandhi's flip-flops. Um, my dogs are from the Dogs Trust. I really, really want to launch, and if I've bent your ear already today, I'm sorry, a social enterprise called Charlie's Den, where we create safe areas for people to let their dogs off the leash and to build social communities around that. And also, I'm diabetic. I want to buy these things and know the proceeds um, go to Diabetes, Diabetes UK or to other diabetes research. Um, everywhere I look, now that I'm truly engaged in this community, I see an opportunity, something I want to do. For me, you know, the issue is how much energy, how much time, and I know I'll find the money. I never become obsessed by the issue of funding. And in fact, some of our best ideas we've delivered without any funding, just a bit of a leap of faith. So thank you for having me. Um, please do ask me any questions. And if you want to find out any more about Blue, do invite me along to speak. Coming up with things to say is not my problem. We've got a million stories. And uh, enjoy tomorrow. Thank you very much.